hopefully nobody objects here. Um, so, um, um, what we have here is uh, a, 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 some of the work we, uh, I will talk about are uh, together with Fabian and I think I have to here. You have to oh, reset. I didn't get share, sorry. Now I'm sharing, sorry. So, okay. Um, okay. So some of the work uh, uh, I'm going to talk about is work together with Fabian. And uh, so that's uh, <coughs> uh, some ver very nice uh, result uh, he has uh, uh, gotten. And here you see a, a very famous ship from the antique, from the Greek, and I will come uh, to the significance of the ship uh, in the framework I will develop. So what I'm not going to talk about is an overview about the experimental and general theoretical status of uh, uh, brain criticality. Uh, I want to develop a kind of thought process. And in the end, uh, for that, it's not exactly for some of you, you will don't know, you will not be familiar with the subject as, as it is, but it will not be really mattering because I want to concentrate on a different point of view, on a devil's ad advocate point of view. And so the uh, uh, general perspective I will take is that life, uh, one of the defining features of life is uh, that is a stationary flow equilibrium. And that <clears throat> I will explain what that is, and that this perspective has, uh, uh, if you take that serious, has a quite a few consequences also on neuroscience uh, uh, issues, and especially also on criticality. And in order to show that, I will first uh, talk a little bit about heavy learning uh, from a also unconventional point of view, namely that this can be considered as a side effect of a stationary activity, to the mass stationary activity. And then we'll come to a spectral ra radius regulation. So, and I will talk about that. And this is mostly Fabian's work. And then once we have that, we will put that together, talk about absorbing taste transition in the brain, uh, ask whether the brain is driven and modulated and what this has then the consequences to our brain criticality. So uh, what is the flow equilibrium now? Um, if you look, for example, at uh, protein uh, synthesis, so proteins in our body are synthesized, they do their jobs, uh, normally they're doing the job being modified, they degrade, and they have to be resynthesized. And that happens on a pretty fast scale. Now, proteins have a very large, array, large range of lifetimes, which can be a few hours or a few days. But the average lifetime of the protein turnover is about 20 hours, pretty short. So if you look into the mirror the next day, and you think you're seeing yourself, but actually half of you is gone. And half of you has been resynthesized. So you really don't notice that. So nevertheless, we achieve a constancy, a certain constancy of our body, of functionalities, and especially also of memory in, in the neuroscience because also the constituent proteins of your childhood memories are resynthesized. They have a little bit longer lifetimes, maybe a few days, but they're resynthesized all the time. And so, uh, so that is what we would call about stationarity. So we have a stationarity or constancy of the functionality, even so everything is in flow. Now, we are not the first to observe that, so here, our Greek mythology comes into play. So Theseus uh, was a Greek hero at the time when really heroes were still there. And he was sailing around on the Mediterranean on his ship. And when he came to Crete, well, he took the opportunity to enter the labyrinth and to slay the Minotaur. And so that was, of course, perished in Athens. And when he came back to Athens, his ship was kept in the harbor <clears throat> for many centuries. And of course, it degraded and has to be repaired and rebuilt. And a few years, actually a thousand years or at least uh, later, Plutarch, who was actually another Greek uh, uh, philosopher, wondered, well, 
is it still the same ship? Are we still the same person? Uh, if all parts have been exchanged and are continuously exchanged. So that is the philosophical part of that. It is, uh, comes under the Caesar ship uh, 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 philosophical uh, problem. And the same, of course, applies to us. And I think we mostly agree that it's a functionality which remains even if our bodily parts are exchanged continuously. On the same note, by the way, there's another Greek philosopher, Heraclitus, who coins the word pantare, everything flows. It's a little bit uh, different perspective, but similar in the sense he was mostly thinking of, uh, of maybe a river and saying, oh, the water is always going, always different, but why do we call it still the same river if the water is exchanging continuously? <clears throat> Go. So now you may think, oh, that is a very high level principle, stationarity uh, of uh, functionality, even so everything is uh, changing continuously. Now, uh, I will talk about Hebbian learning, which is not the main issue here about brain criticality, it's a side uh, issue, but I wanted to show that this high level uh, principle can be really put to work, can really have uh, very practical consequences for uh, questions which involve ourselves and especially uh, neurodynamics. And the argument is relatively simple. For, first of all, we want to define uh, what is actually stationarity. There are surely many ways. And I just use here a very, very simple way. I consider a, a, an observable S, no, sorry, S, uh, and I calculate uh, or define the probability distribution function to make an of, uh, of this observable over a certain uh, period T of observation. So from I have a, uh, the statistic changes all the time with T and I have observ observation T U T. And we, def we define that this statistics is observable if the probability distribution function so the functionality doesn't change anymore. I think I have to change my window. Some sort of something is going. Yeah. Sorry, uh, <coughs> somebody, somebody's working outside. Of course, this is a very simple example. You could take alternative definition, cross correlation function, auto correlation function, or uh, uh, other po uh, possibilities to define stationarity. For our talk, we just consider a simple uh, probability distribution function. And so what does it mean? So let's consider a single neuron with synaptic plasticity. It gets some input. So you have some uh, dendrites, we're getting inputs and has an axon where the output comes, is generated. And there will be a distribution of firing events. Uh, you will have an input of input strengths, whatever. And as long as the synaptic weights here change, uh, the distribution of the neural firing rate will change. So let's say this is my initial starting output. Uh, then after a certain while, I get the pink one. And finally, once I have learned, and once I've learned the synaptic weights don't change anymore, I get the cyan curve, let's say, uh, so this, the distribution becomes stationary. So there's nothing uh, special about that. It's a pretty trivial uh, observation, but we can make use with that. So if learning uh, induces synaptic adaption, and that means our activity evolves, it means when the learning is complete, the activity becomes stationary. But now you can make the reverse argument. If, the, if you want to have your, your activity to be stationary, then you must be able to get heavy and learning rules out of that by demanding your activity to be stationary. So now this is a pretty unconventional point of view in the sense normally you say, well, learning has to do something with information processing and you would like to optimize maybe a uh, functional which measures you how much information you transmit or you have. But here, this is just the stationarity. And that can be put at work, that really works. And we did that with um, uh, <clears throat> uh, Rodrigo. 
And now you might consider of different point of uh, objective functions for stationarities. We selected the Fisher information, which is a very a simple uh, objective function. Namely, you have a distribution function, which is called here P of Y, Y is the activity, and theta is a parameter, which will be our synaptic weights or something else. So your distribution function depends on some parameters. <laughs> and you take uh, the sensibility of your distribution function, you take the expectation value, and you take the log derivative of your distribution function with respect to your parameter theta. <clears throat> and now that means uh, this kind of Fisher information measures whether uh, how much your activity changes with changing synaptic weights. So it measures the sensibility to the synaptic weights. And that means if you demand uh, your, this kind of Fisher information to be stationary, you need to be able to deduce Hebbian learning rules. And that is exactly what turns out. So there was a series of uh, papers with Rodrigo and the way you do that, that is actually uh, analogous to what Jochen, what you did to intrinsic plasticity. It's exactly the same uh, technology to say mechanism just used for different objective function. And so since you have more than one synaptic weight, you have many synaptic weights which are incoming, but we want to have a, a scalar, a differential of op operator. <coughs> We take here uh, this product, <coughs> uh, which we call the synaptic flux operator because of similarity to physics. <coughs> and, uh, and we have shown, it's very uh, simple, then we, when you minimize the Fisher information with respect to synaptic flux operator, you indeed get Hebbian learning rules. And they have interesting properties doing uh, <coughs> uh, whatever, uh, uh, principal component analysis, like most have been learning rules, but have, have also other properties. So I showed you this argument to, to make clear that uh, demanding or considering stationarity as a fundamental operating principle for the brain is not just abstract, but can have real world consequences. It doesn't mean, of course, it cannot deduce have been learning by many other principles, which are completely uh, a fine or equivalent, but you can deduce it from demanding stationarity. So this was a single neuron. Now we want to go to networks and control the flow and, and see how we can control the flow of activity through these networks and make it stationary. And this will be then linked, link us together, link us to the issue of brain criticality. And so the setup is very simple, generic. We have a neuron, which is here the black triangle. It produces output. It, the output flows through a network, comes back as a recurrent network. But of course, the neuron also get external or feed forward, <coughs> feed forward uh, activity. <coughs> and so the, <coughs> uh, the hypothesis is uh, what, we are uh, what we are examining is that the functional brain needs a stationary activity flow so that on the average, time average, of course, there are local fluctuations. We are talking about time average statistics. Uh, the activity should not be too large and not too small, but have a certain time average statistics. We will look first at the isolated system. <clears throat> uh, then we add inputs and look at how we can do the local activity regulation. And this is then linked with then the link to criticality because if the activity is stationary, per definition, it can neither explode nor vanish. So uh, the flow of activity through a network is determined by the spectral radius of this network, which we here take uh, just a little bit take as a synaptic weight matrix is in the first approximation. So if you have your output here, which is here what's coming out, and uh, on the average, uh, it will be scaled by the maximal eigenvalue, which is per definition the spectral radius. 
So the recurrent input will be uh, the rescaled output and the, out and the rescaling parameter is what defines the spectral radius. So for example, if you look at a random matrix theory, for example, you considered a random matrix, which will be our synaptic weight matrix, but it doesn't have to be random, but let's consider it at the moment a random matrix. Then the spectral radius is defined as the maximal uh, uh, eigenvalue. And uh, of course, the matrix is non-symmetric. So you have a complex eigenvalue. And the circular law of the random matrix theory tells you exactly how large the spectral radius is. Namely, it's the square root of n times the standard deviation <laughs> of the individual uh, component of the matrix. And that is why by the, um, the uh, synaptic weights, Wij, normally are rescaled by one over square root of n, because in this sense, in this way, you get a finite uh, spectral radius, which doesn't explode when you go with larger n. <laughs> so um, now, the spectral radius, of course, has a dramatic influence if the system is isolated. We will put uh, input in, uh, in the next or slides, but consider first the isolated system. Now, if you have an isolated system, uh, if the spectral radius is smaller than one, on the average, the activity is reduced and you go to what is called an absorbing phase, maybe to an inactive phase. If the spectral radius is larger than one, on the average, the activity going through the network is enhanced and you will have a finite activity. It doesn't diverge because we will assume that we have nonlinearities, namely the nonlinearities of the transfer function. That is called an absorbing phase transition between a spontaneously active phase and an absorbing phase. And the critical point is RW, uh, the spectral radius being one. These curves, by the way, uh, um, result from our theory, which I will explain in a few slides. And that is very important for equistate networks. So you have a network which uh, uh, receives input and has a, uh, it's like a nonlinear filtering and does some tasks that will come to that. And the optimal regime uh, for this uh, network to work is around criticality. This has been uh, developed by Jaeger and there have been many, many, many people working on that. But Fabian also, we will, I will show some results by Fabian. So, okay, uh, <clears throat> let's put uh, some input now and put some uh, numbering. So we will have an, a variable xi, which is a recurrent input, so the blue one. We will have a variable yi, which is the output of one neuron. The recurrent input one neuron receives, the output one neuron uh, uh, generates. We have the spectral radius, which we call T for target now. We want to have a, a target spectral radius. W is the actual one and T is the target one. And we have a gain, A, which is either the gain of the neural transfer function here or a rescaling factor of the uh, incoming synaptic weights. It doesn't really matter. And now uh, the stationarity principle says we want to have the activity to be stationary. So it means uh, on a network level, we have that the recurrent input is a rescaled output. And that means on the local level, we can approximate by saying my own activity of one neuron uh, should be the same if we scale by the uh, by the uh, by the spectral rate should be the same as the recurrent input because then I have a stationary uh, flow of activity through the network if this condition is fulfilled. And so, and that can be done. Then we look, let's say, at a uh, in our paper we consider discrete time, but what continuous time? Well, that can be done by adapting my parameter, my intrinsic parameter. Uh, in a way that the stationarity condition should be fulfilled. So if my recurrent activity is too large, I reduce, uh, I, I uh, is, sorry, if my, uh, if my uh, 
own activity is too large, I reduce my rescaling factor. If my own activity is too small, I increase it. And that can be done by uh, local uh, uh, quantities. Uh, every neuron does it by itself locally. And when you do that, you really get what you want to do. You do it on a local level. And uh, yes, this is actually not generated, but it's a result by a Fabian of this uh, simulation of a large network, maybe with 200 or 1,000 neurons. And these are all the eigenvalues of the synaptic weight matrix. And they're nicely called, uh, follow the circular law. And they follow, have the spectral radius, which you desire. Um, and so this, we call it flow control, because you, 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 you control the flow of activity. It's pretty nice, because it's a local. You only need local uh, uh, quantities. But you, gen you regulate a global parameter, namely the spectral radius of the full synaptic weight matrix. You regulate it by just looking at local quantities. It's online. You can do that while the network is active and processing input data. You don't have to do it uh, isolated. But of course, there's a caveat. There's no free lunch. Uh, the neuron needs uh, to be able to distinguish external and recurrent inputs, because this works here on the recurrent input and not on the total input. So there's, of course, a drawback. But otherwise, you have very uh, uh, positive uh, 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 characteristics. And so to show you a result, he makes this network uh, giving, give it a task. So we have input data, we have a task, we have the network, and which is adapted by the flow control locally, and we have, the network has recurrent activity. And we, uh, for a task, there are many tasks you can give. We want to, to have a task which is as possible as simple, nonlinear, and uh, has one parameter where you can scale its complexity. And that is the delayed XOR task. So you give the network binary inputs, essentially 0 and 1. And then you ask the output uh, should be the XOR of a pair of inputs, of su subsequent inputs, but of inputs that happened some time ago. Not now, but the time ago and the time delay is tau. So this tau scales the complexity of the task and it's a highly nonlinear task because XOR is not linearly separately. And then you can uh, 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 regulate the spectral radius. You have the strength of the input, which is sigma external. So you have binary inputs, but they are multiplied by certain strengths. And you can calculate how the memory the state is performed. That's called the echo state memory capacity. And this means very high. And this means very low. And there are several curves. I will come to these curves uh, later on. But in general, you see optimal performance is close or below spectral radius uh, of 1. Uh, this is the target spectral radius. I will come to spectral radius, uh, which has been really retrieved. And the optimal performance around 1 is only in the weak coupling regime. So if you have a very small external input, very small, then you have the, then you go here to the weak coupling regime, namely that uh, one uh, criticality is really optimal. But as soon as your input is not uh, very, very small, but uh, uh, sizable, you go away from this critical point. We'll come to, back to that uh, in, in a moment in de more detail. So now we're going uh, to talk in general about the uh, uh, absorbing phase transitions. <laughs> and what I have here, again, is uh, my, my sketch, what, what, what we're talking about. And what Fabian has been able to develop is a complete analytic theory of the what I showed you uh, of these 
network together with an external input. Okay, let me come to what we have. So we measure the activity of the network by the variance sigma y squared of the neural activity. We measure the driving force by the variance uh, of the external input, which includes here the synaptic wave. <clears throat> uh, we define by the spectral weight, the rescaling of the synaptic weight, which is corresponds to the spectral weight of the synaptic weight matrix. And we assume without loss of generality that, this, that the synaptic weights are uniformly distributed and have a uh, variance one over n, so standard deviation one over square root of n. <clears throat> and if you have that, you can write down the self consistent uh, condition for the activity, <clears throat> and which is here. So the external input, the act uh, activity of the network here, here, and here, and the spectral radius. And that is a complete theory of the absorbing phase transition happening under the influence of an external field. And we believe that this uh, description, which I show you now, will show you now uh, more, will discuss more in detail, is essentially exact. There are only two approximations, namely that there are no correlations of the activity, otherwise there will be corrections. And secondly, we assumed we have a transfer function with this tangent superbolicos. And we need to evaluate for the self consistency equation the square of the tangent superbolicos in a very excellent uh, approximation, which is good both for small x and for large x, <coughs> which Fabian used was uh, uh, this approximation. And once you do that, you can do this, uh, you evaluate the self consistency equation uh, exactly and get this analytic result. <coughs> and so the result is what you showed, I showed you before. <coughs> so these lines are not just lines drawn by hand about the numerical results of this equation, these lines here. <clears throat> and as a function of the spectral radius Rw. <clears throat> now consider a very small synaptic external input. So it is 10 to the minus three here. That is a green line. <clears throat> and then we see that is the result of this equation, uh, the activity of the network. The activity of the network dies out and the spectral radius is very small, is small, smaller than one, and becomes finite uh, and going to a, a spontaneously active phase <coughs> when uh, the spectral radius is larger than one. That's exactly what an absorbing phase transition does. Do that, of course, you can also take the limit uh, sigma external to zero, and then you have an exactly square root uh, uh, performance here. Now, if you have a small external driving of 1% only, that's the brown curve. So that's why I'm taking here now the value. You see this picture is uh, changed. By the way, in physics uh, terminology, sigma external exactly uh, uh, corresponds to the external field. Uh, and we see at criticality, we already have a very large uh, spontaneous activity. Even so, we have only a very small driving. Of course, if you take the relative value, it's, it's a little bit less. So because the activity is 10%, the uh, external activity is uh, 0 0.01. So it's 10% of the activity. So the, the ratio of the induced activity in the external would be, 10, would be 1 over 10. <laughs> and um, so <clears throat> we believe we have here a full uh, analytic theory of the um, uh, of the absorbing phase transition. So now regarding the scaling, as I said, the external activity corresponds exactly to what is called an external field. And uh, the, uh, if you look at uh, 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 absorbing phase transition or other, other kind of transition, and uh, you can calculate this is, of course, a mean field theory, the responses. So here, we are in the linear regime. Uh, the induced activity is just linearly proportional to the external activity because we are absorbing phase. Here, of course, we have uh, a finite uh, spontaneous activity, which is proportional 
uh, to the square root here. And at criticality, the induced activity is proportional to the square root of the external activity. That means the response, the response is the uh, induced activity divided uh, to the external activity. That means the response is diverging like one over square root of the, ex of the external field, which is just the mean field uh, result. So I'm coming back to this, uh, to this uh, picture here, I want now to explain all the lines. <coughs> For the de delayed XOR task. And we have uh, three things here the target, uh, spectral radius from the flow uh, uh, control, and the white line is actually the achieved uh, spectral radius of the, of the synaptic weight matrix. <laughs> now, if the external input is very small, the white line is corresponding to the target because then you essentially, the input is not uh, driving very much. Now, how you do this, so this, uh, this uh, result depend exactly, depend in detail on the protocol, what kind of input you have, has the input correlation and stuff like that. But the general uh, point of uh, the general result is that the optimal activity, which is the uh, yellow line here and the actual spectral radius of the uh, synaptic weight matrix are only weakly correlated. They're closely, they're more or less at the same order of magnitude, but, uh, and they happen to cross here, but otherwise uh, there's a certain difference here. So optimality and criticality generically do not, uh, do not really coincide in general, they're closely, they're, of course, the difference is not very large. Uh, there's some difference here, it's already 0.5. So in certain sense, you can say that the large difference already, the 20% difference here, let's say is already large, uh, but they generically do not coincide if the external input is substantial. Of course, if the external input is very small, everything coincides and criticality and optimality is the same. So now I'm coming to the question, uh, to the relation uh, uh, nearly to the end, uh, to what this has to do with criticality and the, and the way to, there, to that point is that we want to ask really uh, what kind of external dynamic do we have? At the moment we considered uh, just uh, a generic random dynamic. Now, since I'm here a devil's advocate, uh, I ask here whether the dynamic of the question of the, of the brain could actually be semantic and not just stochastic. <clears throat> now, this is a pretty complicated diagram. Consider we have this here as our output. And this is, a, let's say, the neural activity, <clears throat> very schematically, of course. These are active neurons and these are inactive neurons, just for a schematic picture. Nothing really to have to do <coughs> this. Uh, reality. Now, uh, generically, we consider if you have an autonomous system that afterwards, after a certain time, we have completely different point uh, of activity, uh, different uh, activity uh, patterns. In this sense, this activity is stochastic, and maybe it's preparing this, the brain. Uh, to process input differently. <clears throat> now, semantic activity, internal autonomous activity means, well, uh, the brain in the resting state doesn't just do something randomly, but it processes internal information. And so the activity, so schematically, is somehow has something semantic content. <clears throat> and now in this classical point of view on the neuroscience, one says, uh, while the input is more or less driven, in the sense, once I have inputs, the activity is determined by the input. And I have to do many experiments and I have something else, I want to average that out. And maybe that is true in a certain part. Surely it is true when the input is very strong. But um, there are also evidence, I'm not going to talk about the experiment here, 
that this is maybe not really uh, the whole story, but that inputs may modulate uh, the internal activity. So the internal activity wanted to be that one. Now the input wants to be that one. And the modulation say, okay, I don't really have what I have isolated, but I will have a certain uh, uh, different, um, uh, uh, I have a modulated uh, input. Now, if this is a case that the semantic, the, 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 the resting state activity is semantic, then it's clear that it needs to be highly regulated because, uh, because if it's not semantic, just stochastic, you have more degrees of freedom, but if there's internal information processing going on, the functional brain needs to have a regulated resting state activity. <laughs> and now this is of course a little bit philosophically and, uh, and the truth will be somehow in between. But the question is, what is the better starting point of yours? So since you are mostly physicists, consider for example, the non-ideal gas, and you have either the starting point of going from the infinite temperature limit and doing a high temperature expansion, or you're going from the zero temperature limit and you do a low temperature expansion. And the same question is here, what is the best starting point for modeling the brain? More like we have stochastic internal activity, which is mostly preparing and waiting for inputs, maybe doing a little bit something else, or mostly that we have a meaningful resting state activity and the input is then interacting with this resting state activity, getting to a complex information processing. The, the, the truth will be in between, of course, but the question is, what is a better, better starting point? And in my point of view, whatever the advocate point of view is, that this is a better starting point of view by way or way better starting point of view. But one can, of course, have very different opinions on that. Now, does this all make sense? To give you an example, <laughs> uh, what this uh, could be, of course, there are many different ways to put that into life, but not many series yet. <clears throat> that uh, one example to put that into life, the modulated brain is semantic learning. We have internal activity, which is semantically here, neurons active, inactive, uh, and then you can have some sensory input and you interact with this sensory input. <clears throat> and the, the brain is all the time active, active while you get sensory input. <clears throat> And some time ago, we developed a model for that. And we showed this is just a, just a proof of uh, possibility or, or, or principle that you can do that. <laughs> so the input were bars, over uh, bars, but not simple bars, but uh, suited with the bars probably. So they overlaid two or three uh, of more vertical and horizontal bars, nonlinearly overlaid. <laughs> The network, network was all the time active. It has uh, states, neural activity states, denoted C4. These are not just single neurons, but clusters of neurons. <laughs> and it interacted, uh, and the interaction, as the input, would modulate the activity flow. And in the end, you had uh, learned, uh, in the sense, the predefined pre-existing activity state acquired semantic meaning in the sense they were associated to individual bars of the bars problem. And uh, the claim is here not that what we did at that time was very biologically, but it's a proof of ex existence that you can have that, you can have meaningful internal activity, you can be active all the time, interact uh, with the input and acquire semantic uh, learning. <clears throat> so this just to argue that uh, this point of view is not just a, a high level abstract point of view, but you can put, if you want to do that, and put it to work and uh, make a meaningful uh, models for that. So <clears throat> now to the last part, is the brain regulated or self-organized? <clears throat> well, uh, we all know that the brain uh, use a lot of energy, about 20% of the body for the humans. Now, what is this energy used for, for, for the brain? So the classical point of view is that most energy is, uh, the brain is used is for doing nothing because keeping up the resting state because about 95 of the energy used by the brain is just uh, for resting state activity. 
<laughs> and more or less, it's of course not so easy to really uh, to estimate. Only five percent is for, for, for processing inputs. <laughs> so that is here. Uh, quite a few people worked on that. The picture here is by a <laughs> from a, a relatively recent uh, paper by Sanguta, Stemler, and Tristan. And so uh, synaptic transmission takes up a lot of uh, energy uh, action potentials or so spiking a little bit for keeping up the resting state potential and other stuff. But most of that is for the resting state activity. So from that point of view, uh, it makes sense that the resting state activity does more than just have a good statistics. So does the brain do all the stuff just to generate a resting state activity with a good statistics, which can then process input or has it a meaningful activity? So in this sense, uh, it is a very simple, uh, uh, this is my last slide, slide, a very simple uh, 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 consequence one can draw. So we consider that the ongoing resting state activity is essential and hence needs to be regulated. Now, of course, uh, and it has to be functional for a wide range of activity because even so on the average inputs are relatively, uh, 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 inputs don't matter so much for the brain as a, as a whole. Locally, a certain brain area can have pretty strong inputs from other brain, uh, brain areas for a certain period. So you have to be functional for a wide range of activity uh, and for a wide range of input activity. And if you look at this picture, uh, that can, is, you can achieve that only close to a critical point. Because if you are very low here, your activity is essentially only given by the output activity. And so, uh, about the input activity. And if the input activity fluctuates, uh, you cannot regulate that uh, very closely. If you are here, well, <laughs> you are very uh, uh, stable uh, activity, uh, no problem with that, but essentially you cannot uh, interact uh, easily with the, uh, <coughs> with the input. So you need to be around this critical point to fulfill all these criteria. Now, if this is true, it would mean that the evolutionary driver for having the brain close to here, which quite a few of experimental evidences I didn't talk about that suggest, would be activity regulation. Of course, you also have improved performance here, but this would be a side effect. So for, from this point of view, uh, being close to a critical point, having improved performance is good, is nice, uh, but it would not be the main uh, evolutionary driver, but the stationary principle, namely you have to have a, a regulated activity would be the evolutionary driver. That's it, what I wanted to uh, tell you. And I guess maybe there might be questions. Thank you, Claudius. Uh, I'm applauding for all of us here. Yeah, thank um, you. Very thought provoking and a clear presentation at the same time. Um, I will stop.